Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome at our uh, conference uh, on spe specialized uh, courts in the capital market and, and, and corporate law. Uh, we are very happy to, to welcome our speakers and the audience. Uh, when we first uh, planned this conference, we very much hoped uh, finally we will be able to do it on site. But due to the situation currently in Austria, uh, we are still in the lockdown. Uh, we need to move to this online platform, but we also decided to split this conference into two blocks with the second block following exactly in a week from now, next Friday. And we hope the other block will be held uh, on site. So this, this hybrid format will be today only online and um, on the 17th of December, hopefully, on site here in Vienna at the premises of Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, and on behalf of the Polish Academy of Sciences Scientific Center in Vienna, as well as our partners, uh, Vienna University of Economics and Business and uh, Center for European Company Law, under the aegis of which this conference is organized as a ninth event in the series, uh, in a tradition that goes back uh, all the way to 2005. Um, I'm very happy to, to welcome everyone um uh, and and uh, i will just say a few words um introductory words and then i will hand over to our uh, um, um, uh key guest who will also welcome you on behalf of our partner organizations and then we will move on to, to the sessions and to the keynote uh and to start with uh uh i as, as i mentioned we are we are in vienna and 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 i speak on behalf of the polish academy of sciences scientific center in vienna and actually this is a paradox. We have a very limited credibility when it comes to uh, specialization because our center is quite the general. We, we, we are supposed to support Polish Austrian academic exchange in all fields. So there is very little specialization, so to speak, uh, uh, in, in our center. So this credibility to, to address the issue of specialization might be limited. But due to our very reputable uh, Polish, Austrian, and international partners. I hope, I hope we can signal some credibility uh, to the to the topic. Uh, 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 um, uh, the, the partners, I, I, I will keep mentioning them all. You have you see them clearly, clearly, clearly on the, on the slide. This this topic uh, uh, we have been working on for quite some time. It all goes back to the year to 2017 when I was first asked to drown up uh, a draft uh, legislative uh, uh, guidelines for the establishment of uh, a specialized capital market court in Poland. I, it was uh, an assignment from the Warsaw Stock Exchange. Uh, I worked on this with my colleagues, Michał Bobrzyński, Kamil Nowak, and um, Krzysztof Grabowski, who will also speak later. Uh, why is it so important? We see the world around us, the world of labor is characterized by a progressing specialization. And this is obviously true for uh, legal services as well, specifically for the development of law firms. Uh, and since various branches of law are becoming increasingly complex, uh, the market uh, correspondingly creates demand for um, expert knowledge for specialized attorneys. And we see this around the big law firms. They have now dozens of departments sometimes, uh, IP, IT, energy, competition, M&A, corporate, capital market, litigation, uh, construction, labor, white collar crime, and many, 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 many others. Uh, on the other side, we see a rise of boutique, law firm who seek their competitive edge in uh, sometimes very narrow specialization with uh, a portfolio of very specific cases handled and and, and advisory in this very, very specific uh, uh, fields. Judiciary also embarks on this specialization trend, although, as we also see, judiciary remains behind the developments on the uh, uh, private market in the, in the law firm set. Now, whenever we think of judiciary, uh, we usually, and this is the traditional uh, way of thinking, we see judiciary as one of the three branches of the government, of, uh, of authority, of public authority, of power, uh, along with uh, the legislative power and along with the executive branch. And this obviously is, is, is correct and true. But what we probably don't get to realize uh, frequently enough 
is that judiciary more than uh, legis legislative power and more than the executive branch is closer to citizens, is closer to businesses. And we should also look at judiciary to see its dual nature. It is not just one of the branches of the government. It is not just one of the branches of author public authority. It is also a provider of public service. And if we emphasize this uh, latter dimension, that is along with the former one, we should see also judiciary along with other providers of public services, schools, universities, healthcare. And this is so often overlooked. And whenever we realize this dimension, we other keywords should come up to our mind. And those are organizational culture and customer friendliness, how efficiently and how, so to speak, customer-oriented judiciary is. What is the culture? And does this culture come any close to what we see on the private market? Uh, we are focusing uh, on uh, corporate litigation, and we are also focusing on settling uh, investor claims on the capital market, on broader, on the financial market. And we see corporations have very sophisticated, uh, efficiency-oriented culture. How far can we say the same about uh, judiciary? Uh, so this will be one of the aspects how we will uh, uh, look at the courts as we discuss this today and next Friday. We will talk about the pros and cons of judicial specialization in general, with a particular focus, as I mentioned, on uh, corporate disputes and on capital market. As we know, when we look at substantive law, uh, we see progressive Europeaniz Europeanization. We see progressive harmonization and oftentimes even unification of substantive law. We see a lot of this in corporate law, but even more so uh, in capital market law and in financial regulations, where European law actually prevails and the substantive law is today more European than just national. But the law that we have on books is one thing, but how this law is interpreted and eventually applied is left up to public authorities and among those to the courts, uh, which are organized by uh, the countries. Uh, there is no, there is no or very little uh, power on the side of, of uh, European Union to decide on the structure. On the structure, there is actually no side. There are only, there's only discussion about certain criteria. And uh, there are some aspects, and those would be my final words, uh, that I would like to, to draw our attention to. I already mentioned the organizational culture, uh, this orientation towards uh, uh, settling claims effectively. We see on the capital market and in corporate law, uh, those, uh, those fields have become very, very complex, multi-layer nature of, of the sources of law. Uh, and also uh, the time is the key aspect, specifically when it comes to deciding on corporate affairs, when we have a, a, a dispute concerning uh, uh, appointment of the directors or general meetings, time is of essence. And we want to have not just final judgments rendered uh, quickly and efficiently, but also uh, there is a need for um, injunctions uh, to, be, to, be, to be rendered very quickly. The question is this uh, need is addressed in a proper manner. A second, uh, second aspect uh, is a, a, a certain paradigm uh, shift. We are meeting now online and we, our speakers come from different countries and uh, the distance is not a problem today. The judiciary often is still organized uh, based on this uh, traditional paradigm of geographic proximity so that the justice should be brought close to citizens. And of, of course, it is understandable when it comes to uh, family disputes, maybe also labor law, maybe criminal law, uh, the, the court should be located physically close to, to citizens. But when it comes to business, distance is not 
of uh, of significance today. What is what matters today is the com is competence, is is specialization. Uh, and if the court is in one city or on another city, it does not really play a, a big role. And I think pandemic uh, uh, helped us understand this even even uh, better. And the four point, because I I, I finish, uh, is a very important one. And this one is judicial independence. And we are uh, we are witnessing a discussion also in Europe, in Poland, other countries about judicial independence. And there are some aspects that I think deserve also a closer attention. Uh, and they are often overlooked in the discussion on judicial independence. Because what does it mean to apply to apply the law? Uh, what is the uh, dividing line between the law and as we know the judges are supposed to know the law, cura uh, novit jura, right? Cura novit jura. This is the principle that is widespread in Europe. But when it comes to very complex questions of financial instruments uh, and other very sophisticated uh, uh, fields of law, and when we have a generalist judge confronted with those, uh, we see often uh, an expert witness to be invited. And the dividing line between what is law and what is specific knowledge gets blurred and blurred. And as we see from the practice, uh, very often expert witnesses uh, decide actually uh, on the case and the court just follows what the expert witness delivered. At the same time, we have no uh, any guarantees in place to guarantee independence of expert witnesses. So it is quite important question when it comes to digital independence. And the more specialization we have, the narrower law, uh, the, nar the narrower scope for expert witnesses and the better guarantees for judicial independence. But on the other side, if we have a uh, case law concentrated in just one court in the country, it on the other side, it would be uh, way easier for a lobbyist to try to exercise influence in this one very particular point rather than uh, throughout the country where we have many many courts to to to, to decide on on on, on uh, litigation so therefore there are some pr chances and risk when it comes to uh, judicial independence that are uh, connected or related to, to to the specialization in judiciary and having said this i would like to give opportunity to our uh, uh to our um uh, special guest today and i would like to hand over to professor martin wiener who will speak on behalf of vienna university of economics and business uh, martin please thank you very much Arik. um i would like to warmly welcome you here in vienna unfortunately only virtually on behalf of the Vienna of the University Vienna University of Economics and Business and uh, I would like to thank um, Professor Radwan and congratulate him for the excellent program he has uh, prepared for us for the next two days uh, which, which I really am looking forward because uh, this is a very important issue and the difference between generalized judicial expertise and specialized knowledge is of course, and an issue in any legal system and for any legal system. And any legal system will continually have to strive to find the right balance between these two factors. And um, Professor Radwan has mentioned a number of factors, specialization, knowledge. Uh, he has mentioned regulatory capture at the end, uh, independence of expert, independence of other influential players. And I'm certain that we will have an opportunity to touch on all of these and many more issues in this today and, and next Friday. So um, this is an excellent program um, uh, with extremely interesting presentations and issues. And I'm certain it will be hugely enriching for me personally and all of us who have the opportunity to be together here for uh, two days of interesting conference. So I will very brief and stop here just in order not to hold you up too much from the really interesting things. Uh, thanks, Arek, for the uh, organization. And uh, well, I'm really looking forward to what we're going to hear today and next Friday. Thanks a lot.
Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, just to remind everyone, Professor Wiener will have his presentation next Friday, to which I am very much looking forward. And I also invite every one of you. Two days in this exceptional situation means not just today and tomorrow, it means today and next Friday. Now I would like to invite Pavlos Mazaros, uh, who is uh, 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 has many roles, but he will speak on behalf of Center for European Company Law, which is also our key partner, which is also umbrella organization for many institutions. And this very conference is under the aegis of CECL. Uh, Pavlos, uh, please, floor is yours. Thank you, Arek. Uh, it is a pleasure to virtually be uh, in your company today. And uh, on behalf of CECL, I can say that uh, we are excited to partner up with uh, the Polish Academy of Sciences, the Vienna chapter, uh, in relation to uh, the uh, conference that is going to be held today and next week. At uh, the Center for European Company Law, we've always been um, um, uh, very interested in uh, business and corporate litigation. Our uh, latest conference uh, a few years ago in Rome uh, dealt with uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms in uh, corporate law. And uh, we're very happy that uh, this conference is going to deal with uh, litigation with specialized courts and litigation therein in relation to corporate law. As uh, is the case, um, arbitration is always very interesting for corporate practitioners, but we all know that there are issues with the recognition and enforcement of the rulings that of the arbitral awards. So it has always been very intriguing for anyone who is practicing uh, corporate litigation that at some point uh, in most jurisdictions, a specialized corporate court would emerge that would not have the issues that the arbitral venues do. So we're excited that we're going to be learning a lot in relation to developments in a number of jurisdictions. Uh, as far as specialized corporate courts are concerned. And again, Eric, thank you very much for uh, being our host uh, today and next week. And uh, thank you once again um, uh, for being uh, so accommodative of uh, CCL and its endeavors. So I'm looking forward to uh, some very interesting um, uh, presentations today and next week. Thank you very much, Pavlos, uh, uh, for, for your um, kind words. Uh, and now we have uh, our final speaker in this welcoming session. Uh, uh, surprisingly so, because Mariusz Hawady, whom I would like to welcome now, who is the General Counsel to the Republic of Poland, uh, uh, was supposed to welcome all of us in next Friday. But since this is not certain yet, maybe it not next week, but this is, so therefore, we decided to kindly in, uh, invite you to, to join our opening session now. And the added value of this conference is international dimension, but it is also uh, uh, to bring different aspects. We have judges, we have attorneys, we have academics, and we also have someone who has hands-on experience with litigation representing state treasury, which I think adds value. Uh, Marius, I would like uh, now to hand over to you uh, uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Arek. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I do like I would like to start by saying thank you to all the organizers uh, of this conference. Um, I'm grateful, in particular, to Professor Arkadiusz uh, Radwan and the employees of the Scientific Center of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Vienna for addressing such an important topic like specialized courts uh, from the business perspective. Nowadays, we observe a trend to specialize highly in a selected field of, field of law. Um, this is what boutique law uh, firms do, providing tailored services to a narrow group of clients. Um, this is also visible in corporate law firms or even government-related uh, legal offices. What comes as um, no surprise is the um, emergence of highly specialized regulators overseeing specific um, market segments uh, or even ombudsman, ombudsman uh, offices taking care of narrow 
uh, groups of clients or consumers. Somehow we can um, even say, in contrast to, to this uh, trend, we observe the continuous or, uh, of a generalist approach uh, to a law uh, among professional judges who still, in most um, jurisdictions, deal with a vast and diversified uh, array of dispute, uh, disputes. This type of approach, along with the insufficient expertise, may lead to um, certain issues like difficulty in applying the provisions of law properly or understanding co uh, complex uh, factual background of certain cases. Disputes um, related to capital and financial um, uh, market transactions could be a very good example of such cases. As um, Richard Posner himself once uh, observed, um, a judge confronted with such problems sometimes reacts not by trying to properly understand the case at hand, but by relying on legal technicalities and uh, he or she does not get engaged in the substance of a dispute. Such situation is a contradiction uh, not only with um, expectation of parties seeking the uh, protection of their rights, but also with the very nature of the right uh, to court. One of the natural and um, inevitable responses to rising demand for a specialization in the judicial uh, profession is the growth of alternative dispute uh, resolution area. Uh, proponents of arbitration often point out that um, it enables parties to appoint arbitrators uh, best qualified to solve um, a given dispute both in factual and legal dimension. The same can be said of the parties free to choose a mediator or conciliator. Um, the advantages of IDRs are undeniable. In fact, the office, um, and in, in fact, in the office, um, I have the honor to be the head of um, the General uh, Council of the Republic of Poland. A few years ago, established itself a court um, of arbitration and is um, actively promoting mediation with the participation of state owned companies. Nevertheless, um, IDRs cannot be regarded as a universal cure uh, to all problems of the judiciary. IDRs um, have their limitations, especially in the areas regulated by the public law, where the outcome of a, a dispute is relevant not only to parties, but also to the society as a whole. The recent case law of uh, the European Court of Justice, initiated by landmark ruling the ACMEA case, can serve um, as an excellent example in this um, regard. This leads us, leads us uh, directly to the um, topic of our conference, uh, closing the justice gap uh, in investor protection. I'm honored um, and delighted to be invited to this uh, honorable circle of distinguished experts who will address the topic of uh, specialized curves from the perspective of uh, capital markets uh, disputes. It seems that um, in many regards, establishing uh, such curves uh, may become um, an answer to the growing need to provide professional and efficient judicial protection to investors involved in capital related um, uh, disputes. There is a hope, not unfounded, um, that such solution would inspire trust in the justice system, contribute to boosting investment and lower investment uh, related risk, because higher trust in the legal system is always, ben uh, is is always sorry, beneficial to the economy. We believe that specialized, um, specialized um, uh, cards represented by dedicated specialist judges would help to keep consistency of um, uh, judgment, judgments. More predictable uh, case law and more efficient procedure can encourage parties to settle the uh, disputes and, of course, will also help to reduce the case load um, in the wrong uh, run. On the other hand, uh, maybe risk connected. Uh, with the lack of judicial specialization uh, should not be overestimated. Um, in certain categories uh, of courts, including the highest uh, ones, it's difficult for or even impossible to uh, attain the high level of uh, specialization, yet um, judgments of these courts are often uh, widely uh, respected. Excessive specialization of the um, judiciary uh, can result in the fragmentation and uh, lack of coherence uh, of the legal uh, system. Um, with this in mind, it's always necessary to carefully consider where and to what extent specialization it, um, is needed. 
That's why the um, subject of judges specialization and specialized uh, courts is a fascinating one in terms of the potential and consequences it brings as well as limitation it may uh, require. I'm convinced that um, the present conference uh, will bring us closer to proper understanding of this matter and will help um, to formulate certain postulates or will even uh, lay some groundwork uh, for the future legislative uh, works. Once again, I would like to cordially welcome um, all the honorable speakers and guests and wish you an interesting and effective discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Marius. We have our welcoming round completed now, which allows me to invite our keynote speaker and move to the next item on our agenda. And the keynote address will be delivered by Jacek Jastrzemski, who is a professor at the University of Warsaw and since I think three years now, the chairman of the uh, KNF, which is the Polish Financial Market Supervision with uh, a former experience in the banking sector as um, in-house um, attorney and with international um, experience as well. Uh, uh, Jacek holds um, LLM from, from, from Berkeley uh, and uh, he will share with us his views on the ideas and prospects of judicial specialization specifically when it comes to the discussion on establishing a specialized capital market court in Poland. I don't see Jacek with us, but I guess Ernest is coordinating I'm, everything. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. You are already here. So Jacek, having I'm said here, this, Jacek. I'm very, very glad to see you. And well, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Adek, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to meet you uh, online today. I hope and there are still some chances that we'll uh, have, have the opportunity to meet in person uh, in a week from now, but let's see, let's keep, keep our fingers crossed. Um, I'm very grateful to, to, uh, to ADEC for having us uh, as a partner of, um, of this scientific event, uh, along with the other uh, re reputable institutions uh, whose logos or names you can see at the bottom of the slide. And uh, what I would like to do uh, in my keynote speech is uh, um, to flag some, f first of all, to, 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 to provide you with some general uh, remarks or comments on how we see uh, the trend of specialization and what we believe to be the, um, the main advantages of this, uh, of this trend. And then I would like to dig into more detail on the proposal that was submitted some time ago uh, by the Arab Hunt Institute, uh, a proposal for a, cap for a capital markets court uh, that could be established in the Polish legal system. Um, because we, um, as the Polish Financial Supervision Authority, uh, of course, we are also a key stakeholder of uh, of this uh, of this undertaking, and uh, I would like to share with you some comments that uh, that, that that you have from from our point of view uh, as the financial supervision authority. So uh, to start, of course, it's it's needless to say among the participants of this of this conference, but just as a starting point, uh, of course, I have to point to the uh, to the uh, growing and growing uh, uh, complexity um, uh, of uh, capital markets legislation and regulations. Uh, which currently are a, uh, are a multi-level uh, multi set of regulation issued both at the uh, European level and at national levels. Uh, the, the capital market regulation or legislation consists of uh, various pieces of legislation starting with very general ones at the level of directives or even at the European treaty level and then going down and down um, uh, to, to, to pretty technical regulations uh, the, or technical guidance which are issued, uh, but, uh, for example, by the European Securities and uh, Market Authority, but also by regulators at the national level, including the Polish Financial Super Supervision Authority. We have also our, our piece in this uh, regulatory and legislative work, uh, issuing uh, soft law regulations that are, uh, that are addressed to our supervised entities. Um, and the complex, actually, the complexity of legislation and the complexity and ever-growing amount of, um, of legislation in the field of capital markets has become even to be pointed as one of the risk factors as, or one of one of, of, of the of the risks that are potentially um, relevant for the capital markets and uh, its participants because uh, the time and the skill and the uh, and the resources it takes to stay up to date with this set of regulation is becoming more and more 
uh, considerable and also that uh, there is some cost attached to it and some risk attached to it. So that of course speaks. Uh -huh. And one thing that uh, of course also uh, is worth mentioning is also the um, uh, the, 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 decision, the decisions of the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union, which uh, in, in its jurisprudence often touches upon uh, notions or topics or concepts that are very fundamental for the operation of the financial uh, system. Now we can we, we have seen the um, activity of the of the court in connection with consumer cases. That this was particularly relevant for the Polish banking mar market, but it may also become a uh, a relevant topic for the for the capital market because the consumer protection is at the heart um, of the European uh, of the European regulations and what we see from the also from the financial supervision perspective is that the activity of the of the European Court of, or of, the, of the Court of Justice of the European Union is becoming a more and more relevant uh, part of the picture uh, of the of the regulatory landscape so to say mm. that of course uh, provides us with arguments. Uh, speaking clearly in favor of uh, specialization, uh, because it has it is becoming more more and more difficult to stay up to date, to follow all the regulations, to be to be at the at the heart of of the regulation. So um, uh, that 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 clearly speaks in favor of um, of giving the right to adjudicate in disputes related to the operation of capital markets to individuals who can devote uh, all their time and all their professional efforts um, uh, to this area of law, which may not be the case. Uh, in, uh, in 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 court of general competence or or in general court, so this is clearly clearly an advantage of the specialization. Um, Adek, in his opening remarks, uh, mentioned uh, some trends that uh, uh, additionally support these observations. Uh, so the, the the trend that uh, that has become like a hype of the of the recent months is the trend related to digitalization of many operations. Uh, what we see in the business, but also in the public administration, is uh, digitalization of um, almost all processes, uh, front-end processes, sales processes, but also uh, back-office processes related to claims handling, uh, also to the operation of the judiciary. Uh, and this is also a factor that uh, very much supports the idea of the specialization uh, in, um, uh, in, uh, in the judiciary. This is related to the fact, uh, which Adek also mentioned before, that uh, what we've seen so far is that uh, uh, in, in the judiciary, in the in the organization of the judiciary system, the territorial availability uh, seems to have played a significant role. Uh, but with the with the widespread use of ICT technologies, of remote access, of remote uh, procedure, uh, this allows uh, for a gradual departure from uh, from the traditional paradigm of the territorial availability towards a new paradigm of let's say digital availability uh, which may, which 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 makes it far easier to uh, to centralize some functions and uh, also to specialize them because centralization and specialization probably goes uh, hand in hand in this case um, and uh, i would also like to f to refer to some of the arguments that have been raised um, in the document prepared by the Allerhand institute some years ago uh, the, the document called uh, the assumption for the court, for the for the court uh, of the capital markets, and uh, the, the arguments that that have been raised in this report and th that we share and that are also kind of like substantiated by our supervisory experience are the following. So first of all, um, uh, this is um, efficiency, and efficiency comes also from the fact that the, the judges that are specialized or that will be specialized, they uh, can immediately they, they can they can immediately identify uh, the key uh, the key issues in the dispute so they they focus their attention on on, on what what is the heart of the dispute and they don't have to spend uh, too, too much time or too, too much effort on identifying what is what is the what is the real what is the real um, uh, source of the dispute between the parties uh, which which of course which which of, which of course allows them to to streamline the procedure in a significant way yeah, this is also related to the second advantage, which uh, which uh, which means that uh, they can significantly limit the amounts of evidence that will be taken in connection with the proceeding, because uh, the evidence will be by definition limited, or should be by definition limited to this evidence which is relevant for the for the resolution of the dispute at hand. Uh, and as we as we know, evidence taking exercise is probably the most time-consuming and the most burdensome uh, in many of the court proceedings. 
which means that the, a reasonable limitation of the scope of this um, evidentiary uh, procedure is, is also very beneficial. Uh, third advantage, with, which Adek has also touched upon, and my understanding is that this will be also covered by, uh, by one of the panelists, uh, Dr. Grabowski, uh, either today or in a week from now, is uh, the, the fact uh, that, that in, a, in a general court, uh, which has to handle cases that require very uh, narrow uh, specialized knowledge, uh, you run the risk of uh, some sort of mixing up of the roles be, uh, of the judge and the expert witness. So you may end up in a situation which was also mentioned by Adek, where actually uh, the, 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 the resolution uh, comes more from the expert witness than from, than from the judge, which then raises additional issues related to how to ensure independence, uh, how to provide all the institutional guarantees that apply to judges, but not necess necessary to expert witnesses and so on. So uh, the specialization, of course, may, uh, may kind of like uh, facilitate this by, by reducing the role of, and, and I'm not saying that we, that we don't want to have expert witnesses. Of course, they may be uh, very useful also for, pro for, for specialized judges, but then the, the, the division line between what's up to the judge and what's up to the, um, uh, to the expert witnesses can be, can, can be defined more clearly. And then two additional arguments, which we also see in our practice uh, at the PFSA, um, uh, because as uh, maybe for, 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 for the non-Polish participants, uh, one clarification that um, we also, we at the PFSA, we issue administrative de decisions related to the financial market, not only capital markets, but, all, but also to the other sectors, which then are subject to judi judicial review by, uh, by administrative courts. Uh, and uh, we haven't, we don't, we, we don't have a specialized administrative court, which would be, which would be responsible and competent for uh, matters related to, um, uh, to, to, to the judiciary control of the KNF, the PFSA decisions, which means that our decisions, when they are challenged in courts, they are reviewed by general administrative courts. And uh, this provides us also with some sort of experience on what are the, what are the issues and, or what are the potential Mm, uh, potential observations that can be relevant for the for the project of having a specialized uh, capital markets court, and uh, what what we what we see is that the ju judicial review of administrative decisions um, is a very is a very form is a very formal process, and uh, I can imagine that this applies not only to the PF to the review of PFSA decisions, but it may also apply to um, to uh, to other disputes related to the operation of capital markets. And uh, the reason for this that I can identify, it's some sort of a behavioral explanation, is that uh, the courts uh, are much more familiar with procedural matters that are general and that are similar, that are similar irrespective of the, of the substantive, of the, of the substantive uh, matter of the case. And then the courts are tempted, because this is a natural temptation, like we all, we all do this, to, uh, to focus on matters where we feel familiar uh, with and uh, where we feel uh, stronger. And that basically means that the courts have a, tenden a tendency to focus on procedural matters rather than digging into the substantive matter of the case. Um, and, and of course, this means that, uh, that sometimes the substantive matter will remain unsolved and the market won't be provided with authority on this substantive matter that is really at the, that is really at the heart of the dis dispute. But instead, the court will Mm, will will base its ruling on some procedural matters uh, like evidentiary matters or uh, some general matters related to, admi to administrative proceedings or on time limitations that the court, uh, that, 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 have, that, sh that 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 apply in a given case and limit the uh, the competence of the financial supervision, for example, and so on. Uh, so that, that this is also related to the fact that mm, if we had a specialized court, I would imagine the the people at this court, the judges, um, to be like very close to the market. Um, and this would provide them with some understanding on, of what are the currently important issues that are, uh, that are significant for the market. What are, what are, the, what are the new questions that, 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 that have a significant uh, impact on the operation on the market. And then I would imagine such a court uh, to be willing to take the opportunities to provide the market with some authority on, uh, on these issues. Of course, this is like also related to, to like general approach to judicial activism, 
uh, be, because you, you may have a, you, you you may have different trends. You may have you may have a trend where the court um, uses procedural regulations or uses uses procedural arguments to avoid uh, providing the market with authority or to avoid digging into the uh, the heart of the dispute. But you may also have an like, opposite approach where the court shows a more um, activist uh, activist position, and then the court tries to use the opportunity to provide the market with authority uh, and to uh, and, and to, to give um, uh, to give light to the market so to say on uh, what is the ju judicial approach to the operation of, of on, on some of the concepts and what I would what would be my hope related to the operation uh, of a specialized court is that su at, at such a court the judges would, 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 be, would be people who like live the life of the markets and know what currently puzzles the market in legal terms, what are the issues that uh, require some authority, that re require some guidance, and then uh, in, if, in case of a given dispute, which gives the court a chance uh, to review this matter, this substantive matter, then the court won't, uh, uh, won't hide, so to say, hide behind the veil of some procedural uh, requirements or some procedural questions in order to avoid uh, digging into the matter, but on the opposite, the court will will use the opportunity to to speak loudly and to provide uh, the the general public or the market participants with uh, with authority. Uh, so th these are these are the arguments that that speak, of course, in favor of um, uh, of specialization. And one may say that it's quite difficult or it's hard to imagine a reasonable alternative to specialization. Uh, before moving into more detail, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be briefly um, refer to some uh, to some examples that we that we that we have seen worldwide. So, so maybe one general comment is that uh, specialized specialized courts um, are not uh, that uncommon uh, because uh, a world a World Bank's report from 2012 actually shows that uh, specialized courts were established in 23 countries, and it's also one of the um, uh, one of the IOSCO's uh, recommendations. Uh, to to have a specialized courts that will ensure the trust of the market participant in the operation of the market. So uh, it's not that uncommon. It's not that original, and maybe it's something that we should treat rather as a um, as, as some sort of a of a lag that we that we have here uh, in Poland. Uh, moving to, to to some prominent examples. Of, of course, one example that I um, that, that I uh, that I have to have to mention is is of course the Delaware Court of Chancery, uh, which is uh, which is probably the world's most renowned uh, corporate court. Uh, it's not a capital markets court per se, but it's uh, let's say more of a of a business court. But uh, what it's what what I believe to be spe especially worth mentioning is that actually the the quality not only of the Delaware business law, but it's also the quality of the uh, of the court um, that has allowed the state of Delaware. To become the United States probably one one of two or maybe even the most uh, prominent uh, corporate uh, jurisdiction um, in the states. Uh, so so this clearly shows how uh, how the quality of um, of the adjudication and how the quality of of the business of, of how the business disputes are are resolved can contribute to the uh, to the success. Um, of the economy or of the jurisdiction, and this becomes especially true in cases where we have the growing, um, uh, the, the, the growing, let's say, the growing degree of of competition between legal systems and between jurisdictions. So that that may clearly become a a competitive a competitive edge for for a given jurisdiction. Um, another example that I would like to that I would like to mention, which is significantly younger than the Delaware Court, is the Tel Aviv Court. Um, is the Tel Aviv Court for Securities and Corporate Law. Uh, it was established in 2010, and it has uh, proven to be a to, to be a significant success and a, um, a milestone in the development of um, uh, of the Israeli market. Uh, it, it, so, so it was so it was uh, described by um, a prominent uh, Columbia professor, and then uh, was then appointed as head of uh, the Israeli Securities Market Authority, Professor Zohar Goshen, who. Who, who, mentioned, who mentioned that this this is a milestone in, in the enforcement of the, on the capital market, and the court uh, the court uh, has proven to be extremely active uh, in uh, providing the market with authority and with with interpretation on how uh, some concept uh, should operate, and that's uh, exactly the role that I would hope uh, such a court could fulfill. So to be 
to be the to, to, to be to, to be the, the entity that provides that provides the market with authority especially that as we all know I, I mean at least the lawyers among us but probably we all feel intuitively that in in, in today's today's times with uh, such a fast pace of economic development and fast pace of the development of the market uh, it's quite natural that the law and regulations um, that are at least one step behind i mean one step probably it's a very optimistic diagnosis probably there are some steps behind um, which means that the law will never be up to date with the current needs and current developments of the market and then you need to have this, some sort of gap fillers and the, one of the gap fillers uh, is the activism of the judiciary, judiciary which will come up with um, with authority which will come up with interpretation that helps to solve or to, to fix the gap between what the market needs today and what the law uh, maybe will be able to come up with tomorrow or the day after tomorrow uh, and actually this is this is inevitable because I cannot imagine a world uh, where the law would uh, try to um, be uh, before the market in terms of development so probably this would never work and uh, this could only have a um, uh, have a um, negative effect on the developments of the market so this is a natural situation where the law is some steps behind but that's why you need to have these gap fillers with one of the gap fillers being being the act activity of the judiciary the other gap filler is the activity of uh, supervisors and regulators like the knf where we also have some tools like soft law where we can react in a swifter manner than the legislator can uh, but uh, today we are talking about the court so uh, i just wanted to mention the court activism the, ju the judiciary activism as, as some sort of, of a gap filler uh, and then this brings us also to, uh, to 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 one question because probably it's a, it's a more question of uh, of policy but uh, i would like to maybe to mention this this here uh, also uh, the, key, the keynote is also always an opportunity to raise some issues where actually I don't have an answer, but to raise them in order to maybe uh, to maybe inspire the discussions in the panels, and then maybe hear at least some uh, some potential solutions to this to this issue. Because the, the one of the questions, which is a policy question, is that to what extent uh, the um, the financial market or the capital markets in particular should rely on public enforcement, and to what extent um, it should foster private enforcement. Uh, one prominent example of a legal system which fosters private enforcement is of course the uh, US uh, legal system with uh, the procedural regulations uh, uh, because it goes down not only to the capital markets regulations it's, it's also related to, to the procedure, uh, procedure to the court procedure to, uh, to matters uh, on for example to the, to the issue on how, um, how the legal system approaches to, to legal costs, uh, to, to the cost of proceedings and so on. So, uh, the, the, of course, this requires some uh, coherent approach from the, from the lawmakers. But uh, that's, that's a question which is also related to the, question, to, 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 the, uh, to the discussion on the capital markets court. To what extent we would like private enforcement to become uh, a significant determinant, determinant of the operation of the capital markets or whether we stick with the more traditional approach with uh, with public enforcement being being the core and uh, the israeli example that, uh, that's that's why i this, i'm mentioning this right now because it's also related to the israeli example because my understanding is that the israeli example is to some so to some extent at least uh, inspired with the american approach uh, to give more space to private enforcement because private enforcement has its benefits uh, it relieve, relieves the, the public administration from from some costs, and one may say that plaintiff lawyers act as um, state attorneys to some extent. Uh, so, but that's, but but that's a policy choice. So that, that that's, that's a policy choice which has, has to be taken at a uh, at a relatively high level. And then, but then of course it may it may have uh, its impact also on how we view the role of the um, capital markets court. Because if if we go the route of uh, fostering private enforcement, then we also should think of uh, procedural measures or um, like technical measures uh, that would uh, foster the um, the activity of uh, private plaintiffs. Uh, coming back to the Polish uh, to the Polish uh, landscape, um, back in 2019, the Polish Mi Ministry of Justice has appointed a, a, a working team, a wor working group, which uh, has been given the task of coming up with a concept of a court that will be handling capital markets dispute. Uh, the matter has been also identified uh, at the level of 
the Polish governmental strategy for the development of capital markets, which is, it is a document that has been uh, approved by the Polish government, by the Council of Ministers. And it also points uh, uh, to, to, the, to the dispute resolution in the capital markets as a key area of interest where uh, dedication of additional efforts and additional resources can, uh, can increase the, the, trust, the trust of the market. And we also uh, absolutely share this view that the uh, trust of the market can be enhanced uh, once the dispute related to the operation of capital markets are resolved in a more efficient manner, in a more predictable manner, and in a manner which uh, is in line with, uh, with, with, with the needs and the development of the market. Uh, and now I will, I, will, I will refer more specifically to some of the, um, some of the assumptions uh, that were provided by the, the, by the Allerhand Institute in their report on the specialized court. Uh, and let me, let me start with some general comments. So first, uh, the, the first general comment is that uh, as regards the composition of such a court, um, we believe, or I believe, or as well, as well, uh, personally, but also my colleagues at the KNF, that uh, the, the court should be as professional as possible, which means that uh, we are not, we are a bit skeptic as, uh, as far as the appointment of like honorary members or honorary judges um, is concerned. So we basically believe that um, maybe they, they could be appointed to some, some sort of advisory body to the court, some advisory council, but uh, the, the judges, I would expect the judges to be uh, like full-time uh, judges dedicated uh, to their professional activity in the court, which, which means that probably there would be no, no place for, for an appointment of uh, honorary members that, are, um, that, that become judges by virtue of uh, they, they contribution to the development of the market or whatever. So th this, this, this could be potentially uh, discussed as, as some sort of, as I, as I said, like a, like a advisory council or like a scientific or academic council of such a court, but, uh, but the judges sh should be hands on and this should be their, um, uh, their sole or my main professional activity. Uh, second general comment is that we generally agree uh, with the concept of having an uh, appellate or appeal division in the court of uh, for capital markets so we we believe this is a good solution to have the capital markets court being a two instance court uh, because this would this would provide us with the benefits of having the specialization not only in the first instance but also in the second which is quite natural the only the only thing that uh, that that bothers us a bit or leads to some concerns on our end is that we are we, don't, we, are, we, do, we do not have a uniform appellate procedure uh, that would be applicable for criminal cases and for administrative cases. So um, it, this, would be a, this would be like a dual track um, appellate or appeal process, a different one for, for the civil cases that will be adjudicated by this court and a different one for, for, the, for, for the administrative cases or for the public law cases, which then may um, cause some um, uh, some issues related to one to the organization, but secondly also to the competence, because uh, probably not all not all judges who are competent or who are proficient with uh, administrative appellate procedure are equally competent with uh, with civil uh, um, appellate procedure and so on. So this is this is probably something that should be then uh, investigated in more detail. Uh, this this leads, leads me also to one more general comment from the point of view of the. Uh, of the of the of the financial supervision, uh, because we act we as the finan uh, financial supervision authority we act pursuant to the Polish uh, code on administrative procedure the KPA is the Polish abbre abbreviation. Um, the more and more the financial market develops, and the more and more uh, this development requires a swift responses from the regulator and from from the supervisor. Uh, we believe that uh, the, uh, the code for administrative proceeding is becoming like less and less functional from the point of view of our operation. And of course, it is to some extent a controversial thesis, which I'll present now, but we believe that uh, generally in the ideal world, uh, we should not be bound to act pursuant to the administrative, uh, to the administrative proceeding, uh, because we should be heading for some more pragmatic solution that allow for a swifter response and for more efficient and quicker proceedings. The Polish administrative proceedings code is from the 60s, it, it has been issued in 1960, if I recall correctly. Of course, it has been subject to several amendments, but um, I would, uh, I, I would, my, my personal view is that it 
uh, does not meet the needs uh, of uh, of current uh, supervi supervisory work and does not does not necessarily respond to the challenges that we that we see in our supervisory work so of course uh, once we make this bold move and we decide that maybe this financial supervision to some extent should be exempted from the uh, administrative proceeding code then of course it affects also the questions related to the judiciary control but for the time being uh, what we believe to be some sort of a question mark related to the appellate procedure in the capital markets court is that actually this would be an appellate procedure which would be then divided into civil appellate procedure and administrative appellate procedure which may to some extent uh, defeat the purpose of uh, of having this uh, in one court but on the other hand um, maybe there's no other no other better alternative and the final general comment uh, the final general comment relates to the criminal cases uh, we also shared the view uh, presented in the Ireland institute document that uh, uh, the criminal cases should be left to court of general competence uh, and probably one additional argument that you may use here is the argument related to the equality um, because uh, this this could be probably constitutionally doubtful uh, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, okay to have like a criminal fast track uh, for crimes related to the operation of capital markets with a regular track vis-a-vis -vis regular track for all the other crimes because then we then we encounter the issue of of having a dual standard of criminal liability and criminal procedure depending on uh, the context of the of, of the crime so probably this would raise additional concerns but for the time being we believe that uh, it, it it would make sense uh, for this reason also that i mentioned above uh, to, to leave it to the court of uh, general competence and now moving to uh, to more detailed comments um, uh, like firstly i would like to to touch upon the the proposal to establish a so-called public division of the capital markets court and the public division would be uh, competent for the review of um, administrative de de decisions of the of the financial supervision um, according to the to this proposal the the, the, the the procedure will be structured similarly to the one that we have um, in connection with the decision of the of the polish anti-monopoly anti -monopoly office which is uh, also which is the office for uh, consumer protection and for uh, for competition and consumer protection and uh, in uh, in respect of the decision of the of the polish anti-monopoly -monopoly office uh, there is a special court established in warsaw which is competent for the review of uh, the decision in a proceeding which is generally similar or is based uh, on the civil procedure on, on the polish civil procedure and what is being uh, uh, proposed in the other hand institute document is to have a parallel or similar similar solution applicable for the review of uh, the knf decision um, and then, um, of course, there are some advantages and some disadvantages. Probably one, one of the, one of the, I will start with the disadvantages. One of the disadvantages is that this court uh, will be allowed to take evidence, to take evidence, which we believe it's not necessarily uh, the best solution because actually the matters uh, that uh, that are controversial in cases uh, of our decisions that are brought to court, uh, these are mostly uh, mostly legal matters. It's mostly about legal assessment. Uh, so the evidentiary, the ev evidentiary part, probably it's not that relevant like you may see it in antitrust cases or in consumer protection cases, uh, which means that we don't necessarily see a, uh, a, a strong argument to, to allow for evidentiary process at the, at the level of judiciary control of the decision. Uh, the, the other thing that we believe to, uh, that, that we believe to, be, to be a question mark, I'm, I'm not saying it's, an, it's a disadvantage, but it's a, it's a question mark, is that to what what should be the standard of review of the knf decision should it be a more uh, legal standard of review a, a more stand a more formal standard of review or should we be heading towards a more substantive review um, and that's that's a question that i will leave open because i can imagine clear advantages of both solutions with the formal review being a swifter solution and a quicker one especially that the, 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 we have I, I, I how many minutes Ah, two minutes. Okay, thank you, thank you, Adek. Um, so the quicker solution is to uh, is to is to limit the, the judicial review of our decisions to a to the formal element, uh, especially that we have a two instance proceeding at, at the KNF. So uh, the party has the right to have its case re-examined by the KNF itself, and only and and, and and after that it can be brought to court. So, yeah, but but I can also see arguments speaking in favor of a more substantive review, 
uh, and then if we decide that the substantive review, the, the substantive standard of review is a better one, then this, this would generally support the idea of having a specialized score that would be competent for the review of the KNF decision. And finally, one, one issue that I, that I have to mention, is it is related to the broad remit of the KNF, because we are, in, we are uh, responsible for the supervision not only of the capital markets, but also of the, of the banking sector, of payments, insurance, and so on. Which means that uh, once we decide for a, a specialized score that will be competent for the review of the KNF decision in the field of capital market, then the question appears, what about, with the, other, what, what, what about the other sectors? Would they, would they be subject to the same review by the same court? Or would they be subject to review by the general administrative courts? Probably the, the second solution is, is not the intuitive one, but then it would significantly uh, broaden the remit of, of, the, of, the, of the appellate division or the public division of the, uh, of the capital markets court. Uh, so th these are the questions that I that, that I wanted to raise. Moving to the civil to the civil division, uh, probably I have about, about one minute left, which means that I will focus on uh, on uh, on two matters only. One matter that I would like to raise is that it, it is a, so it, we, I believe it is a challenge to define the scope of the competence of such a chamber because we it's beyond doubt for us that it would be good to have a, such a chamber um, uh, in the Polish legal system which would be uh, which would be competent for the dispute related to the operation of the capital markets but then what we see in the market that we have we have re relatively many cases with many potential plaintiffs with individual investors with retail investors uh, or maybe even not retail but uh, multiple investors that have been that have been harmed uh, in the financial market, and then the question is how we handle those cases, because uh, it would be a bit uh, uh, counterproductive to have the specialized court clogged with individual cases with a relatively low value. Which means that uh, to go forward, to move forward with this solution, we have to uh, we have to we have to find procedural solutions in place that will somehow limit the number of cases. So I can imagine this can be handled with a uh, with a good class action le legislation. It can be handled with uh, with some sort of like you have in Germany the Mustafa Faden, which means that you have a lead case, and then the lead case once the lead case is being resolved, then you resolve all the other cases based on the lead case. I can also imagine some sort of institutional representations of investor, like you have in the bond market or you have in the uh, in the in the fund industry. You have a depository or you have a bank which operates as a representative of the investors. But then this sort of institutional representation would be would provide some sort of a bottleneck and would limit uh, the number of cases that would be subject to review uh, within 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 this court. So these are the questions that I, that I would like to raise today. There are m many others that probably also require discussions, but uh, given that time, uh, as always, is limited, I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, share my thoughts with you. And uh, uh, Adek, thank you very much. So back, 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 back to Vienna. Over to you, Adek. Thank you very much. Thank you so, thank you so much, Jacek, for, for, for your presentation and for uh, for uh, discussing uh, uh, what is on the table and you did it in such a way because this document that you a couple of times referred to is for now only available in Polish but I think your references made it clear also for international audience what are the key points that we are discussing and I think many of those or most of those uh, questions uh, have some universal appeal and are uh, considered and discussed in countries uh, those that already have those courts who are ahead of everyone else and specifically in those countries that are just playing with ideas whether or not to have a court of this type and if so what shape should it take uh, so thank you so much we will uh, we will have a round of discussion after the first session uh, so I would like to announce now a five minutes break for our Ernest who is uh, in charge of uh, putting this all together online and then we will move on with the first panel and uh, Pavlos will take over the chair of the first panel. Thank you so much and uh, uh, I see you, we see each other in five minutes from now. Thank you. So good morning uh, again everyone and welcome to our very first panel in uh, today's uh, conference on uh, specialized courts. And uh, I have uh, the honor of introducing you to three distinguished speakers from uh, Austria, the Netherlands and Spain. And uh, I'm going to say a few words in relation to each one of them uh, in turn. So uh, first uh, is Georg Kodek from Austria. Georg uh, is, has studied law at the University of Vienna and at the Northwestern University School of Law. 
And in uh, 1991, he was appointed a district court judge in Vienna. Uh, after serving at the Superior Court of Eisenstadt and the Vienna Court of Appeals, he was appointed in 2006 at the Austrian Supreme Court. In addition to this, he's professor of civil and commercial law at the University of Economics and Business in Vienna. And he is currently heading there the Department of Private Law. He has published extensively in the fields of civil and commercial law and civil procedural law. And he has also acted in the past as visiting professor in Luxembourg and as a visiting scholar in Australia. Since the 1990s, Georg has also served as an expert for the Council of Europe and later for the European Union in former Yugoslavia, Ukraine, and other Central and Eastern European countries. So Georg will be uh, giving to us the Austrian perspective uh, and um, subsequently, um, uh, Bastian Kemp is going to provide us with a Dutch perspective. Bastian is Professor of Corporate Governance and Corporate Regulation at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And he is also a Professorial Fellow and Vice Academic Director at the Institute for Corporate Law Governance and Innovation Policies. Bastian is a member of the editorial board of the Dutch corporate law journal Mandblad for Ondernemingsrecht and is a fellow at the Zaldas Institute of Financial Law and Company Law at the Free University of Amsterdam and a member of the Corporate Law Advisory Committee of the Dutch Bar Association and the Royal Association of Dutch Civil Law Notaries. Bastian graduated cum laude in 2013 from Maastricht University he obtained his PhD in 2015 and became part-time assistant professor at Maastricht and the Erasmus School of Law. And he currently works as a corporate lawyer at Loyens and Louf in Amsterdam alongside his academic uh, function. After Bastian gives us the Dutch perspective on the Enterprise Chamber at Amsterdam, um, we're going to be um, uh, welcoming Paula Del Val Talens, who is going to be giving us the Spanish perspective in relation to specialized courts and dispute resolution in Spain. Paula is assistant professor of business law at the University of Valencia in Spain, where she reads economic private law topics ranging from company and capital markets law to EU internal market law. So her scientific work primarily focuses on company and capital markets law, as well as Corporate Social Responsibility, CSR. She currently leads a two-year research project on cross-border conversion, mergers, and divisions after Directive 2019-2121 in cooperation with researchers from seven European countries. So a set of three distinguished speakers in this very first panel of our conference today. And I will now give... Um, uh, um, uh, the floor to Professor Georg Kodek, uh, who is going to uh, discuss with us uh, his uh, research on the Austrian experience with specialization in handling corporate, M&A, and capital market disputes. So, Georg, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thanks, first of all, to the organizers of um, today's event. Um, my um, presentation is going to be, as you just heard, about the Austrian experience with specialization in handling corporate M&A and capital market disputes. Now, this is a somewhat cumbersome title. A short version of that title would be the commercial court, or rather plural, the commercial courts in Austria. So I'm going to focus on an old institution, which may also be a solution for some modern problems. Uh, obviously, I'm going to focus on Austria, since uh, this is a country where I have spent most of my life and certainly most of my professional life. Um, but I will try to look a little bit beyond borders and also um, try to address some more general, some institutional aspects. Now, um, let me see whether that remote um, control works. It seems um, it, it does not. So um, can we have slide number three, please? 
seems we can't. But um, I, I, I fortunately, I still belong to a generation. Uh, OK, now it works. Now it does work, which uh, a generation that can also manage without PowerPoint. Now, uh, the tradition of commercial courts in Austria um, goes back, looks back to 300 years. And clearly, the commercial courts are of extremely practical importance, but also, uh, and that already alludes to the more general point of my short remarks, uh, uh, these courts also are theoretical importance because when one talks about commercial courts, one also has to discuss and have in mind some more general aspects, such as the advantages or possible disadvantages of specialization. Can there be over specialization? Can there be unfortunate or undesired effects of specialization? And uh, on a more general level, uh, can business courts, the, the very existence of and access, access to business courts be an advantage for a country as a business location. Now, um, let me start with a brief history of um, commercial courts. And uh, I already mentioned in Austria, they only go back 300 years. Uh, when we start um, with the history of commercial courts, we have to go back to the Middle Ages. And uh, clearly, we have early commercial courts in Italy and later in France. And there, a characteristic feature of these courts was that merchants, business people, business men, as they were at, that, at those times, were sitting as judges. So they were deciding their own disputes. Um, we then have in the early 16th century, the Odelude Commercial Court, the first German language commercial court. And in 1807, we have the French reform. And among uh, the laws enacted by Emperor Napoleon, we have the commercial code. Now, interestingly, Napoleon originally was opposed to merchants as judges in commercial courts because he wanted an influence over appointing judges there, but ultimately he retained the French system of having lay people sitting as judges in commercial courts. Now, most German states uh, adopted a mixed system of professional judges and lay judges, uh, commonly uh, having chambers or panels uh, in these courts composed of one professional judge and two lay judges. Now, in the 19th century, we find an interesting shift of paradigm because originally the idea was let us have merchants decide their own cases. So let us protect class interests of merchants by having merchants as judges. Now, in the 19th century, the idea was different. The focus shifted towards specialization. So the idea of having merchants, uh, business people as judges, um, was to have people who have special knowledge, special expertise with these types of cases. Now, if we focus on Austria now, in 1508, Emperor Maximilian uh, instituted uh, lay judges in a number of um, uh, courts, in uh, commercial courts, uh, first in Leipzig and Nuremberg. Now, the building you see on my slide is not obviously the building uh, instituted by Emperor Maximilian, but is the 19th century Vienna Commercial Court. Uh, in 1717, so a little more than 300 years ago, uh, a commercial court was set up in Vienna by the name of Mercantile and Bill of Exchange um, Court, which had one lay judge and six uh, assessors with legal training. And above that court, there was a appellate mercantile court and there was a second appeal authorized to the Emperor's Court, to the Hofkanzlei. Now, in 1861, there was the General Commercial Code uh, adopted by German uh, countries, and uh, that time that included uh, Austria. Uh, in 1897, Austria adopted its civil procedure reform, and this reform 
retained commercial courts in Vienna, but also in Prague and Trieste. Now, as we all know, because of the outcome of World War I, uh, we lost Prague and Trieste and only uh, have a commercial court in Vienna, uh, where uh, the panels are composed uh, of two professional judges and one lay judge. The lay judge is an experienced businessman. So that's the um, idea behind the, um, this type of courts. Now, let me briefly uh, look to other countries, although we'll have an opportunity uh, today and next week uh, to get more information um, about some of the countries I mentioned here. I already briefly alluded to Italy and France being the roots of uh, commercial courts. I have mentioned Germany. Uh, I should also highlight the 1850 institution of the Hamburg Commercial Court. And nowadays we have specialized commercial panels in Germany within the ordinary Landgerichte, within ordinary regional courts. Uh, we have um, commercial courts in Switzerland in a number of cantons, and there, characteristically, they retain the old notion of having merchants, having business people as judges, so they have lay judges there. Uh, in England, or in Great Britain, rather, we have uh, commercial courts uh, but not by that name originally. We have chancery courts, which were instrumental uh, in developing some areas of what nowadays we would call commercial law. And today we have a court which is called exactly that, commercial court, and we have a technology and construction court. And these courts are parts of the Queen's Bench Division. Um, if we look to the United States for a few moments, we have chancery courts in some states, and uh, we already had in our keynote speech this morning of the Delaware court, which is instrumental, of course, in the development of company law, particularly corporate law. And in 2012, so only less than 10 years ago, there was a commercial division set up uh, in New York as a division of the New York Supreme Court. Um, please note that the New York Supreme Court is contrary maybe to what the name suggests to a speaker, uh, to a listener without US legal training. Uh, it's not a, an appellate court, it is a first instance court. So there they set up a specialized commercial division. Now, let me turn now to Austria, my own country. Uh, on the slide, you see the uh, what's called Justice Tower in the center of Vienna, which houses the commercial court and also the commercial district court and also the general district court for the center of Vienna. Um, we have a commercial court only in Vienna nowadays, uh, which is a specialized court hearing certain types of disputes provided the amount in controversy exceeds uh, 15,000 euros. In all other cities, ordinary regional courts sit as commercial courts. Now, the, there are a number of criteria. Uh, there is a long laundry list of cases belonging to the commercial court, but the most important criterion is any case brought against a registered business. So it does not matter who the plaintiff is. If the case is against a registered business, the commercial court has jurisdiction to hear that case. It also hears certain company law disputes, patent law cases, cases involving the commercial register, and a number uh, of other cases. If the amount in controversy is up to 15,000 euros. Uh, there is in Vienna a specialized commercial district court uh, located in the same building you see depicted on my slide. And in all other places in Austria, these uh, disputes would be heard by general district courts, which then sit as special commercial district courts. But it would be the, the same, the very same court that also has general civil matters. Now, um, let me now um, turn to, if the slides work, yes, to who sits in these courts? Who are the judges? 
a lot of things changed from the Middle Ages and also from the 19th century. Nowadays, almost 99% of all cases are decided by a single judge, by a single professional judge. But obviously, uh, this judge has a tremendous expertise in commercial matters uh, because he sits on the Vienna Commercial Court. Only occasionally, we have a panel composed of two professional judges, so not one, but two, and one lay judge uh, who has the honorary title of Commercialrat, commercial judge, in cases where the amount of in controversy exceeds 100,000 euros, but only if one party so demands, so requests, and that is extremely rare. We only have about 20 such panel decisions uh, in the Vienna Commercial Court every year. Now, when we look at the higher courts, the, at the Court of Appeals, uh, there is no specialized court as such, but the, the Vienna Court of Appeals has specialized chambers, specialized panels, normally composed of two professional judges and one uh, lay judge being an experienced businessman. And at the Supreme Court level, there is no specialized commercial panel, commercial chamber as such, but there are a number of specialized chambers who specialize in areas which constitutes parts of commercial uh, law, such as company law, patent law, unfair um, business practices, and uh, a number um, of others. Now, let me um, turn now to um, investor um, cases. Now, uh, why are investor cases brought to the commercial court? And the answer is simple. The very reason is uh, the, if defendant is a registered business, the commercial court has jurisdiction. Now, that leads, ironically, perhaps, to the Vienna Commercial Court being the biggest consumer court because many investor cases are brought by consumers. And we had up to 20,000 cases pending, investor cases pending, before the Vienna Commercial Court and Vienna District Commercial Court. Now, clearly, that leads to a very high level of specialization. And to illustrate this factor, there is a summary, very brief summary, uh, on all pertinent Supreme Court decisions somehow affecting investor cases. And this summary alone comprises 300 pages. So that shows the degree of expertise and specialization necessary uh, to decide this very special and uh, very difficult, very complex um, uh, part of the law. Uh, but I do not want to just focus on Astra alone. I want to address briefly a few institutional observations. Now, in Vienna, we have professional judges. As I told you, that's different in some other countries. And our code provides a long list, a, a fairly detailed list of competences of these judges. So there is a long laundry list, as it would be called in the United States. When we look at the law applicable to these cases, it's not so much the law in it by itself that makes the cases difficult, but it's the greater complexity of the cases altogether. Uh, it may be uh, that expert witnesses are necessary. It may be that we have a larger number of witnesses. It may be just that um, what the case is about is more difficult than an ordinary run-of-the-mill civil case. Uh, clearly, because Vienna is our biggest city and the Vienna uh, Commercial Court is located here, uh, Vienna is a center of such disputes. And as I already mentioned, the Vienna Commercial Court, perhaps ironically nowadays, is also a consumer court because it decides investor cases provided a defendant is a registered business, which uh, very obviously is very often the case. Now, when we look at the contribution of commercial courts to solving modern day problems, we find a number of areas where commercial courts or the commercial court and the district commercial courts um, court were instrumental 
in paving the way for 20th century and 21st century developments, such as the electronic company register, which was introduced in the 1990s, the Astrian clause action, which was introduced in the early 2000s, um, case management in mass disputes, and perhaps most recently court annexed mediation. All these were developed and later on um, developed uh, further on by the Austrian commercial courts and the judges and uh, working there and obviously the lawyers um, representing their clients appearing before these courts. Uh, in concluding, I would like to very briefly address some of the pros and cons. And we have already heard in the introduction this morning Obviously, there are chances and risks involved when we talk about specialization. Um, if we want to uh, look at the chances, there is a famous uh, quotation I want to share with you by the chief judge of the Court of Customs and Patent Appeals in the United States, Howard Markey. And he compared specialized courts to brain surgery. And he said, if I'm doing brain surgery every day, day in and day out, chances are very good that I will do your brain surgery much quicker or a number of them than someone who does brain surgery once every couple of years. So that clearly is an advantage. A possible disadvantage is a kind of tunnel vision that may develop, particularly if the uh, recruitment of the judges comes only from a very small segment of the profession. A possible example of this would be the Austrian tax court, where judges are almost exclusively recruited from the tax authorities, and that may contribute. I do not suggest it always does, but it may contribute uh, to a sometimes one-sided view. So clearly one wishes to avoid that. It is also more difficult to assess the workload. Uh, if everybody hears run-of-the-mill cases, it's very easy to compare. You have one divorce, so you have one sales contract. But if we compare more complex cases, it's very difficult uh, how many simple cases one would have to hear to make up for one difficult case. And that makes the distribution of the workload sometimes difficult. Also, we have to look at career perspectives. So uh, payment in Austria is the same in all courts, but do we have or do our judges have some other advantages? What about their career perspective? Do they have a, a chance of earlier promotion, for example, if they agree to hear more difficult cases for a number of years? Uh, it seems the answer was yes uh, a few years ago, and perhaps the perception still is the answer is yes, because there never uh, has been a recruitment problem uh, in the Vienna Commercial Court. Uh, another factor is the esprit de corps, the spirit among these judges. They may tend to perceive themselves as an elite core of judges, an elite group of judges. And to a certain extent, that is a good thing if one does not push it too far, um, if it does not get into becoming too arrogant uh, and too proud. But being proud of what one does could also be an incentive for maintaining and perhaps even increasing the quality of the services offered by that particular court. And finally, an important point, the quality of the decision, the correctness, the rectitude, if I may use that term, of the decisions, and perhaps what is even more important, the acceptance of these decisions by the community, by the citizens at large, at large and by the lawyers appearing before the court. That is very important. And we do have empirical data. We have statistics, not for Austria, unfortunately, but for the United States. And there, it seems that having the case decided by a specialized panel may contribute to an increased acceptance of the decision. And that clearly is a good thing if the parties accept the decisions, not just as some 
ruling given by a court sitting high up there by a church sitting up there very high on a bench like portrait in the 19th century by Charles Dixon, but by a um, tribunal which understands the underlying issues, the underlying particularities, the specificities of the case of economy and of everything surrounding the individual case. So on that note, I would like to close my short remarks this morning, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Well, uh, Professor Kodak, thank you very much for this uh, immensely interesting presentation. And uh, I must say that uh, we knew that uh, Vienna is an international uh, center for arbitration, but um, I personally was not aware that there is also a specialized commercial court based in Vienna, and that I find uh, very interesting. Uh, so there is a number of, of interesting points that uh, you raised, which um, we will have the opportunity to discuss um, in the roundtable discussion after the two uh, presentations that uh, lie ahead. Uh, so with this, I would like to turn to uh, Bastian uh, Kemp. Uh, Bastian, as I understand that what's on the agenda is that you will be discussing the um, enterprise chamber uh, of uh, Amsterdam, the so-called Ondernehmingskammer, uh, which is a specialized court for uh, corporate law disputes that has delivered over the years certain very interesting uh, rulings. Uh, so the floor is yours, Bastian. Thank you, uh, thank you, Pavlos. And it's, it's great to hear that your your Dutch is still very good. So that's uh, that's good. Uh, let me check whether I can actually push through the slides. I think that's the case. Yes. Um, so what I am going to do in in give or take fifteen minutes is is discuss with you the the impact of one particular business court specialized business court that we have in the Netherlands which is the uh, enterprise chamber of the Amsterdam Court of Appeals uh, and what I particularly want to discuss with you is why we at least from a Dutch perspective feel that this specialized business court is so successful and as you already mentioned Pavlos it it has made a number of rulings over the years that have been very fundamental to the way we've structured our our corporate law our business law and and our corporate governance and um, as a result of that, you can see that we are also as a country developing our corporate law to a large extent by means of rulings from the enterprise chamber that of course are then in some instances uh, confirmed or, or, or uh, removed by the, uh, by the uh, Dutch Supreme Court. Um, so what I wanna talk about is, is basically, I wanna talk about, about business law from a certain perspective. Uh, which of course fits the enterprise chamber, which is uh, when we have a corporate litigation dispute, um, um, generally we, what we see is that parties involved in the dispute want to obtain some type of immediate relief in order to force the opposing party uh, to either perform a certain act or to refrain from performing certain act. And of course, for a very clear example of that is when you have a 50-50 joint venture uh, one of the parties, one of the shareholders feels that a certain resolution has to be passed within the company and the other joint, their joint venture partner is refusing to cooperate in that. Um, and in that, those type of cases, you would like the court to basically break the deadlock that has, um, uh, has arisen within the company, uh, by means of giving an order to, to do something, uh, to the, to the joint venture partner. Now, in those types of cases, a, a, a claimant generally has two possibilities. Either you use the general injunctive relief proceedings before the relief judge of the district court, which is a proceedings that's open to any party in any type of litigation in which a party would like injunctive relief. So if you have a, a problem with your neighbor or with one of your employees, you could also go to this court. Uh, or you, as a as a as a claimant, choose to go um, to opt in for the specialized judicial proceedings, which we call inquiry proceedings, before the enterprise chamber of the Amsterdam Court of Appeals. And I'm of course going to focus specifically on why claimants in business disputes or in corporate governance disputes and corporate law disputes generally tend to go for the specialized judicial proceedings instead of for the general injunctive proceedings, uh, and what what the underlying rationale is uh, for that for that choice and therefore also for the success of the enterprise chamber um 
So I want to briefly explain to you what is actually the enterprise chamber and what type of what are inquiry proceedings, because that's the way or at least one of the ways that you, you get to the enterprise chamber and the one I, uh, that I specifically want to focus on. Um, so inquiry proceedings allow certain interested parties uh, to request an inquiry, so an investigation to a certain extent into mismanagement uh, in relation to corporate governance issues within the company and its affiliated in entities. And, and next to that, the interested party that makes the claim can also request immediate or definitive measures to be ordered by the court in such situations, which is basically the, the breaking the deadlock type of order that I just uh, discussed. And these inquiry proceedings have a number of objectives, which I included on the slide. Uh, at the end of the day, there are, I think, two types. The first one is to basically recover or restructure the relationship within the company uh, in order to safeguard the interests of the company and the enterprise connected to it. And at the same time, by means of the investigation, uh, it's possible to either obtain information uh, that leads to a potential measure to keep uh, 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 the, the persons or entities responsible for, his, for mismanagement uh, accountable. Now, there are a few characteristics that you need to keep in mind with the Enterprise Chamber and specifically with inquiry proceedings, which is it's very much limited to uh, in scope to corporate governance issues, um, um, which means that if you have a more contractual claim, so a claim of a contractual nature or, or a tortious claim, you would, they, those would typically be inadmissible before the Enterprise Chamber in inquiry proceedings. However, what we do see in practice a lot is that contractual disputes tend to revolve, resolve or, or also become corporate governance uh, um, disputes, especially when we're, for instance, talking about shareholder uh, shareholder agreements. Uh, and therefore, you can still basically get your, your, your dispute into the enterprise chamber and into the inquiry proceedings, as long as there is a corporate governance angle to it. What inquiry proceedings are very specifically not uh, meant for is to, to establish damages or to establish a tort. Uh, of course, the report about mismanagement can lead to that conclusion in separate proceedings, but they are, uh, uh, but it's not the the goal of the proceedings themselves. And the second thing, which which is very interesting, I think, also for this conference, is that um, the enterprise chamber is a specialized court, and it's composed of three judges and two experts who are not a member of the judiciary, but do have expensive exper extensive experience in business uh, or related uh, types of, of enterprises. And they are typically either experienced, so the, the layman's basically are typically either experienced accountants, CFOs or, or bankers. And this creates an interesting dynamic that you can also see when you're actually arguing before the Supreme, uh, before the enterprise chamber, because in front of you, you not only have three experienced judges, uh, appeal judges, but next to that, you have two experts in business who, who have a lot of experience and who know a lot about what happens in the boardroom, who are very well aware of how annual accounts work, how, how the financing of the business works. Um, and that means that also on those items, it's possible to discuss uh, to discuss those at a very high level during the uh, during the hearing and you will also get very specific questions on that from these um, uh, from these experts um, and they will also give their their input on the judge the judgment itself and um, so that creates a very very useful I think dynamic for the court to decide on corporate governance or uh, corporate disputes in general, because you have all these different inputs that the court can use in order to come to a, um, uh, to, to a solution. And what we generally also tend to see is that the experts ask very different questions than the judges themselves, which, which for a lawyer in front of the uh, enterprise chamber can sometimes be a bit challenging. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think for the outcome of the case, it's definitely, uh, definitely a good thing. So. To talk a little bit more about the uh, the inquiry proceedings themselves, um, there is a certain threshold for actually being able to go to the enterprise chamber. I've mentioned them on the on the slide. I think the most important one is that you need to own ten percent of the shares, which means that or at least ten percent of the shares, which means that as a as a small minority shareholder, it's not possible to go to the uh, uh, to the enterprise chamber. This is slightly different in very large listed companies because we also have a threshold of twenty two and a half million. Um, in nominal value, uh, um, then you, if the company has that nominal value in shares, then, then you 
can also as a 1% shareholder go to the, uh, the enterprise chamber. So for the very large listed companies, it's different, but ordinarily speaking, you need to have at least 10% of the shares. And, and there are a few other uh, possibilities as well, including the company itself and the trade unions. They can all go to the enterprise chamber and actually do that on occasion, at least. Um, interestingly is that we have this threshold to actually get into the proceedings to be, um, uh, to be allowed to have jurisdiction there. Uh, but at the same time, as, as soon as these proceedings are launched, any interested party, uh, which is a relatively broad uh, uh, condition, is allowed to join these proceedings by filing their own implica uh, applications. Um, and they may support or oppose the requests uh, or the original application. Uh, and they may also make their own inquiries or ask for their own immediate measures, which creates a very dynamic process and a very flexible process in this type of litigation, because it means that if you have a governance dispute, it's not only the shareholders or the board of directors that can take a position, but it's, for instance, also individual members that can take a position. The, the works council or trade unions or employees can take a position. Uh, even, even a financing party of the company could take a position in this litigation, although they generally tend not to do that. Um, but it means that there's a lot of influence from, from all kinds of stakeholders in the corporation that can join these proceedings and take their own view and ask their own, make their own requests to the, uh, to the court. Now, because these are inquiry proceedings, as it's in the name itself, there is uh, uh, there are two phases to these proceedings. The first one is that you uh, make it as an interested party, make an application to the enterprise chamber request, requesting an inquiry into the policy and affairs of the, uh, of the relevant company. Um, and you can ask for immediate measures. And if the court rules that an inquiry has to take place, uh, only then can it uh, uh, also uh, uh, order immediate measures. And it will appoint an investigator, which is generally uh, a, a legal scholar or, or an attorney uh, or a lawyer that will, will do the investigation. And uh, uh, the investigator has a lot of room to ask questions to the party, to obtain documents, to have even hold, hold certain hearings. Um, and he will draft an inquiry report. And based on that inquiry report, any interested party can decide to file a basically second phase petition with the enterprise chamber, asking the enterprise chamber to establish that mismanagement has taken place and to uh, order definitive measures such as the removal of certain directors uh, uh, from the company or even uh, the transfer and uh, the temporary transfer of shares into the hands of a, uh, of a trustee that will hold the shares for the time being. Um, that also brings me to probably the, the, the reason why most parties in the Netherlands actually go to the enterprise chamber and inquiry proceedings, which is the request for immediate measures. Um, um, it's interesting to note that the enterprise chamber has a lot of room when deciding on what immediate measures to take. And we also know from our foreign colleagues that, that this is actually quite surprising to many, but the enterprise chamber basically on on the basis of weighing the interests of the party and parties involved can take almost any type of immediate measure that it wants to take there are a few few limitations that i've included on the slide but i want to specifically focus on what is possible and for instance what the court regularly does almost uh, in most cases actually does where it actually orders interim relief or immediate measures are appointing independent directors which may then also have a costing or deciding vote uh, suspending directors, uh, suspending uh, the execution or implementation of certain resolutions, for instance, the resolution to call a general meeting or to issue shares uh, to parties, uh, suspend voting rights on shares or even temporarily transfer shares from a shareholder to a trustee, which means that we also have to explain to, to parties that are litigating in the Netherlands sometimes that it's possible for the court to, based on one hearing, uh, decide uh, and the filings of the parties decide to temporarily take the shares from the individual shareholder and transfer them to a trustee who will then at least temporarily decide uh, how the rights on the shares should be exercised. It can go even further. We have seen certain cases where the enterprise chamber, for instance, temporarily amends the articles of association of the company in order to make it possible 
to make certain changes uh, within the organization or within the capital structure of the company. We see that, for instance, in cases of emergency financing, where the company needs uh, um, additional funds relatively quickly, and one of the shareholders uh, has a blocking vote and is unwilling to cooperate. There we've seen that the court actually sets aside uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the casting vote or the blocking vote of the individual shareholder in order to make the financing possible. I'm going to skip the duration in the interest of uh, time, but it's basically for the time of the proceedings themselves. What's good to, to know, and I've shown it briefly on this graph, is that um, we have had the possibility of inquiry proceedings since the 1970s, so we've introduced them in 1970. Uh, however, they've only become more popular and, and really um, uh, quite quite forceful in in the development of corporate law since uh, since the, the middle of the 90s, where in 1994 the court got the opportunity to uh, to order immediate measures, which was a possibility they did not have before. In 1996, Hugh Willems became president of the enterprise chamber, and he very proactively, um, uh, yeah activated basically the corporate community and the and the corporate academic community to start using the enterprise chamber for corporate disputes specifically focused on obtaining immediate relief uh, and in 1998 the um uh, the amsterdam court of the ordinary amsterdam court of appeals ruled that the enterprise chamber takes precedent in cases where basically both the enterprise chamber and the, uh, the relief judge of the district court have jurisdiction to order immediate reliefs and where parties go to um, at both instances. So, for instance, one shareholder in the joint venture goes to the district court, the other one goes to the enterprise chamber. Then the district court has to say, well, in this case, the enterprise chamber takes precedent. So, either I don't order any immediate relief or I Im order an immediate relief, but only until such a time that the enterprise chamber has decided on the case. Um, and in the graph, it only goes to 2008, but you see a very clear rise as of the middle of the 90s. Nowadays, we are, for the last 10 years, it's about 50 to 60 cases each year that are brought before the Enterprise Chamber. So not an extreme amount of cases, but still, the Netherlands is not a very large country. And, and this is, the, I think, the vast majority of corporate litigation, corporate governance disputes are brought before the Enterprise Chamber instead of for the uh, ordinary court of, um, uh, or the ordinary relief judge. And that also brings me to my last slide, so um, which is on why is this specialized court now so successful? Why do we in the Netherlands, why, why are we happy to it with, with an extent? Um, I think that has four reasons. First of all, it's a specialized chamber with experienced judges and experts, which means that uh, compared to the relief judge, which only which sits alone, you here have five judges or at least three judges and two experts that 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 together decide on the case, which means that you probably also have a more balanced ruling at the end of the day, or there, at least there's a larger chance of that uh, that happening. Um, the inquiry proceedings before the Enterprise Chamber are very, very flexible. As I just discussed, they're also very informal, which means that all the, the, the relevant parties can actually uh, uh, put forward their posi position on what, what would be in the best interest of the company, how the dispute should be resolved. Um, the Enterprise Chamber has a, has a large amount of tools available to um, uh, apply far-reaching intervention in order to actually solve the dispute, which means that if you go to the Enterprise Chamber, you, you will at least know that the Enterprise Chamber could, based on, on, on basically on the legal rules in place, could uh, apply the far-reaching intervention that is necessary to solve a dispute. Um, and the enterprise chamber is, is mainly focused on protecting the interests of the company itself. So basically the target in the litigation. Um, and, uh, and thereby also takes a less traditional role, uh, to, or less traditional approach to litigation compared to other, um, other courts that look far more at the position of the claimant and the position of the defendant and maybe less at the position of the target uh, itself. Um, and that also, at the same time, explains why the uh, relief that the relief proceedings before the relief judge are less uh, generally less attractive to the uh, to the parties. Maybe one last thing to mention is that um, uh, since the enterprise chamber is part of the uh, Amsterdam Court of Appeals, it means you only have one first factual instance instead of two. Where we in the Netherlands we generally have two: so district court, court of appeal, and then the Supreme Court. Here we only have the Court of Appeal in, in inquiry proceedings. We only have the Court of Appeal and then the Supreme Court. And before the Supreme Court, you can only uh, ask 
for basically nullification of the judgment based on either the wrong applicability of the law by the court or uh, insufficient motivation, which given the very broad discretion of the enterprise chamber is also very difficult to argue before the Supreme Court. So it's, it's a bit like arbitration in the sense that you only get one, you get one shot to get it right, um, which makes it at least more effective in, in the, um, in the way that it, uh, in, in the way that you litigate. Um, and, uh, and that's it, uh, Pavlos, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Bastian. That was uh, very interesting, uh, of course, and uh, it's definitely the enterprise chamber is uh, definitely a very innovative judicial tool that the Netherlands has introduced uh, in comparison to just any other uh, member state of the EU that I'm aware of. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm sure that it will be um, uh, very um, useful uh, for uh, for the attendance. Uh, of, of our discussion to get some more insights during the roundtable discussion uh, that will uh, follow. So uh, with this, I'm, um, uh, I will now uh, pass the torch to Paula Delval Talens. Uh, I understand, Paula, that uh, you will be discussing the gap between public and private enforcement in uh, listed companies uh, in Spain, um, which, which uh, I think is uh, also very topical for a number of other jurisdictions because um, uh, that gap does exist elsewhere as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking to, um, um, uh, to hear what the Spanish perspective upon this is and what, what uh, remedies perhaps the Spanish legislator has developed in order to close that gap. So, Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let's see if I can... Yes. Um, it is uh, with great pleasure that I join the conference today, even in the bitterness of not having been able to, to join you physically in Vienna. I can only hope for a better chance to do so in the future. And I, of course, wish all the best to the conference next week. Um, I would like to take a brief moment to thank the organizers and hosts for their impeccable efforts. And, and indeed, my contribution is in line with the rest of the panel with uh, to uh, explore the interplay between public and private enforcement um, as regards public listed companies and specifically um, as regards corporate governance uh, regulations. By uh, this, I would like to, to delve into an emerging discussion on uh, whether um, a gap uh, in the interaction between public and private enforcement exists. Um, and this is whether there is an enforcement deficit and there's, or this would mean that there's an alternative uh, policy framework that we did, would need to reflect on. Uh, since public listed companies are subject to very different provisions in company law and in financial regulation, as I said, I will specifically focus on provisions regarding to corporate governance. And by these, I mean organizational rules regarding uh, the composition of the board of directors, the way in which a company manages her relationships with investors, and also perhaps the way in which directors administer the exercise of um, shareholders' rights. As you know, typically these provisions are contained in um, companies' domestic legislation and sometimes arise from uh, EU law. These are harmonized spaces. I will refer to this set of provisions as hard law, but as you all know, their function is, is reinforced today by soft law, by recommendations that are contained in corporate governance codes and that typically operate under the comply or explain principle, which means that uh, the public listed company needs to abide to the content of the recommendation or otherwise justify the reasons why they would depart from its content. Um, as a result of, uh, of that, uh, compliance with corporate governance or even non-compliance is typically reflected on the annual corporate governance report that public listed companies all around continental Europe need to issue on an annual basis. The purpose of the 
working paper is rather modest. I only intend to contribute to show that such a gap exists indeed, and eventually try to tackle what amendments would be necessary on which of those set of enforcement tools, public or private. Um, however, my um, uh, purpose today is to uh, briefly cover three main points. Uh, the first one would be to discuss why is it relevant from a scientific and practical viewpoint to actually tackle the existence of a gap and why is Spain a good choice or a feasible option to discuss the issue. And then I will briefly discuss uh, the theoretical framework for both private and public enforcement. Here we see a huge difference and that is the fact that um, the literature, scientific evidence is enormous as regards simply consistent with the available evidence. Spain. Um, I've lost, um, yeah, perfect. Um, so, uh, the, as regards to, to the relevance of the issue, uh, what I see here when I try to tackle the, the topic from a functional horizontal perspective, what we see is that different European continental jurisdictions have different corporate governance models. And here, the difference that uh, is uh, the most important, I would say, is one that has not been extensively explored and refers to different models of corporate governance codes. Here in continental Europe, we see industry codes, those that are encouraged by public listed companies' representatives themselves, and those that um, are uh, authored by commissions or agencies attached to, to the government that could be um, attached to a ministry, such as it is the case in Germany, or attached to the National Supervisory Authority for Capital Markets, and that is the case, for instance, in Spain. And my assertion here is that um, institutional models, in countries that have institutional corporate governance codes, may be uh, inclined to a stronger public enforcement. Uh, that would be specifically the case um, for uh, systems like Spain, where the National Supervisory Agency authors herself uh, the code and its recommendations and is responsible for the enforcement of the whole, um, the public enforcement of the whole corporate uh, governance as, as such. However, as I said, uh, studies uh, regarding the interaction of corporate governance, public enforcement and private enforcement are, as are to my knowledge, very limited um, today. Um, if we uh, turn to, to private enforcement uh, and to the available framework in which we would uh, be able to, to discuss the issue, uh, we uh, see something that is very well known. Um, with the uh, major corporate uh, governance scandals in the early 2000s, such as Enron or Parmalat, uh, there were uh, enormous calls for more focus on enforcement, but the focus was placed specifically on private enforcement. In this way, for the better part of the last two decades, scholarly uh, debate has discussed uh, how private enforcement unfolds in uh, corporate governance in public listed companies in Europe and has shown what uh, obstacles hurdle uh, actual enforcement within continental Europe. Uh, today, I would only uh, like to point out three uh, factors that are probably uh, well known to the audience. Uh, European public listed uh, companies are concentrated ownership structures where um, the majority or the block holders uh, typically um, hurdle the exercise of such claims and this is typically related to domestic company law constraints, for instance, the lack of a stand to exercise a claim or uh, a very high threshold uh, for, uh, to exercise a minority right. When I refer to these, I refer to claims uh, relating um, or claims against a resolution of the general meeting or the exercise of a director liability claim, may that be direct or even derivative. 
And the third factor that the literature has shown is that um, a certain lack of court specialization is, is usually attached or at least not helping the development of private enforcement within all of these uh, jurisdictions that have been studied by, by previous scientific evidence. It is true, however, that uh, in most cases, Spain was not among the chosen jurisdictions uh, in only one recent exception a study back from 2020. But uh, when one becomes familiar with the Spanish environment, we see that like in the rest of continental Europe, claims against uh, resolutions of the general meeting and uh, director liability claims are extremely infrequent. And yet again, Spain is a very concentrated ownership uh, system as regards public listed companies. And whenever we see cases uh, being actually uh, discussed uh, in front of our business courts as regards public listed companies, we see that those cases are what I call strident. This is they are not representative of the kind of uh, uh, issues that arise within public listed companies on a general basis. There are very exceptional cases. Uh, for instance, the ones um, on the slides refer to the removal of directors that were appointed through our minority uh, designation uh, mechanism, the one we have in Spain under the Companies Act. Uh, a competitor was designated by means of this mechanism and the majority of the general meeting would immediately remove the nominee director of a competitor. And then in every case, the removal was deemed by courts justified. So these are strident cases that do not represent the typical uh, issue within a public listed company in, in any jurisdiction in continental Europe. And um, the the third uh, issue or feature that I that I uh, would see that uh, makes uh, the Spanish uh, system consistent with the previous evidence is uh, our limited specialization of business courts. Uh, specialized business courts are in place. 14, since September 2014, but these are one level specialization business courts. This means that a Spanish business court holds jurisdiction to decide on all business matters ranging from company and insolvency law to competition and industrial property rights. That is a one level specialization system and evidence shows that for uh, actual expertise of business to uh, have an actual outcome on the result of the judiciary decision, we need at least a three-level specialization system. So uh, we would say the level of specialization of Spanish business courts is acceptable, but uh, is not in accordance uh, with what the evidence tells us that would be or would actually have an impact on the outcome. This is not to say that business courts in Spain have not uh, contributed to uh, the development of uh, Spanish company law. They have done so, for instance, as regards the uh, development of the business judgment rule that was uh, indeed developed uh, within business courts in Spain and then codified in 2014. Uh, let me uh, then uh, move, uh, or in the hope that I have shown that uh, private enforcement in public listed companies in Spain and in continental Europe is restricted generating then the first part of the gap of enforcement, I will then move to uh, public enforcement to try to uh, show that uh, the other set of rules as regards enforcement is uh, equally restricted or limited. The difference here is that we do not have a theoretical framework that is comparable to the one that we explored as regards private enforcement, despite the fact that the framework has been intensively reinforced in the last or in the past years and in spite of the task and the position of the ESMA. Uh, however, we see that corporate governance and some specific matters within it, such as non-financial disclosure, are actually supervisory priority areas. So we can expect uh, this to unfold and to be developed within the, the next few years. Um, if we, uh, in the absence of, of more evidence, if we take a look at the Spanish example, I would claim that the Spanish model of public enforcement is built on solid stakes 
because, uh, as I said, we have an institutional model where the NSA, the Comisión Nacional del Mercado de Valores, both authors the code and then enforces it through um, the supervision or of uh, annual corporate governance reports. Uh, I would like to uh, briefly comment the way in which uh, our agency actually enforces uh, her powers uh, by uh, pointing out three main ways that are nevertheless very restricted or very limited in practice in the way the agency uses them. The first one are information requests. Whenever this report uh, is not sufficiently clear as regards the reason why a recommendation was not followed, the agency would request clarification. When she is not satisfied with this uh, additional explanation, she will practice the enforcement technique of shaming. This is, uh, she will point out what public listed companies did not abide or did not explain sufficiently in the annual report. Um, however, we see here that um, the uh, evidence in Continental Europe on shaming as a public enforcement tool, specifically, specifically in corporate governance, has not been explored very far. I would say that uh, here we see uh, a market enforcement technique being actually applied by a, a public authority. And I uh, would say that uh, this is worth uh, discussing uh, in the future. And the third uh, possible way of enforcement is one that the agency does not um, use at all. Uh, the Spanish National Authority on Capital Markets rarely, I would say, never imposes sanctions to its public listed companies for the infringement of any provision regarding uh, the annual corporate uh, governance report or the corporate governance report. What we do see are sanctions in this field regarding uh, the non-disclosure of shareholder agreements. In Spain, we have a regime on the transparency of shareholder agreements, a system similar to the Italian model, if you're familiar with that. And that is the only case where the agency does um, impose sanctions for corporate governance matters, but not in the field of recommendations. What is lacking in the European literature is a full explanation on why that would be the case. Uh, to finish my presentation, I would like uh, to briefly point two reasons. One, I believe it to be the um, continuous use of the comply or, or explain principle that we see, for instance, in the shareholders' rights directive, we see it in the non-financial reporting directive. And this technique is essentially a nudging one, but not a sanctioning one. So pushing it forward would oppose actually promoting or encouraging uh, sanctions by NSAs. And the second uh, reason, and this is my, my final point, would be uh, something like a protectionist regulatory capture on the part of agencies that, to my knowledge, has also not been explored in this area, but only in other uh, very close um, fields such as the banking union. Uh, with this, I, I just simply wanted to, to show you what this gap on the enforcement in public listed companies seems to be, at least to my understanding, and I uh, would like to finish here my presentation and uh, hand the floor over back. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paula. That was uh, very interesting, and uh, it kind of um, um, complements uh, with what our other two speakers were discussing before, that the setting up of specialized courts uh, was sought by legislators in order to um, make up for the fact that perhaps in many instances, private enforcement is not uh, sufficient. It is, of course, a very effective mechanism, especially for listed companies. Uh, if the share price goes down, this is a disciplining mechanism, but uh, at times we do need uh, stakeholders to be able to seek uh, specific remedies in court that are enforceable. So uh, with this, uh, I would like to officially launch the, um, our roundtable discussion uh, where Jacek is also going to uh, partake, uh, who was our keynote speaker uh, for, uh, for today. So uh, let me first say that um, any attendance uh, may type questions.
questions that they have or remarks that they have and they wish to be addressed in the roundtable discussion in, uh, in Facebook, if they're watching over Facebook. And uh, we will make sure to pick these questions up and try to address them. Uh, but before this, um, let me, let me uh, begin with uh, a question to Professor Kodek. Um, it, it, it was uh, with great interest that we saw that Vienna has um, a specialized commercial court. And I understand uh, that this court has jurisdiction not only over corporate disputes, as is the case with the Enterprise Chamber in the Netherlands, uh, but um, over any, just any commercial law dispute. And my question then would be, um, if we are to juxtapose this to uh, the Dutch case, the Netherlands has recently introduced it, a, 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 the Netherlands Commercial Court, which is a court that can uh, rule over uh, commercial law disputes, as I understand is the case with the Vienna Court, but proceedings are, can be conducted entirely in English. So my question to you is whether you see um, an option um, um, in Austria that the parties can have proceedings before the commercial court or perhaps a section thereof in English, whether this is something that is being currently discussed. And if yes, how would you see that development in terms of what is at stake in commercial disputes? Um, thank you. Um... The answer to your question is yes, uh, this is a thing that is currently discussed. And in Germany, we have already a few commercial courts which offer proceedings in English. And uh, we also had a suggestion a few years ago made by the Chamber of Lawyers, by the Bar Association, uh, to introduce a similar system in Austria in order to attract high profile cases um, to Austria and perhaps um, to Vienna um, and to open a, a, a business opportunity probably for Austrian lawyers as well and maybe for uh, uh, restaurants and hotels and, and, and uh, other incidental industries involved in big litigation when you bring a lot of people here. Um, I, I'm Currently, there is no institutional basis for this. So uh, clearly, uh, there are cases where occasionally judges um, conduct parts of hearings in English, but they would not write the decision in English. Uh, I remember when I was a young judge in as early as 1991, I held a trial in English with the consent of the parties, but there was no statutory basis for this. Uh, so the discussion is, should we introduce something like that? And would it be an advantage for Vienna or for Astra as a whole as a place of business? if international companies know uh, they in, in, if a controversy arose they would have the opportunity to have that case decided in a language which is um, which they are comfortable with so uh, it is being discussed but no decision has been reached yet Thank you, Professor Kodak. And um, I am having a question uh, from one of the attendants that is addressed to you in relation to lay judges. Um, um, uh, the, the question is, how, what is their profile? How are they selected? I mean, is there a pool of uh, candidates that courts regularly draw upon to have lay judges on the bench, um, or or there and just anyone can act as a lay judge in relation to commercial cases. Um, yes, thank you. Um, there is a pool, but first they have to be appointed, and uh, they are appointed by the Minister of Justice. And the idea is to have people with considerable expertise in business. And also, ideally, to have people with expertise from different um, areas of business. And then they are appointed but, and have that honorary title uh, of um, 
commercial judge, which in Austria, in a, a former monarchy, a country where people still are fond of titles, uh, is important. So it's not the remuneration, it, it, it's the title that makes that position attractive. And then occasionally they sit, as I mentioned, nowadays they do not sit very often because the Vienna Commercial Court would only have somewhere between maybe 15 and 30, so three zero uh, uh, cases per year where a, a, a full panel of two professional judges and one lay judge would sit. Uh, on the uh, Vienna Court of Appeals, uh, the figure is clearly higher because in all commercial cases, they decide uh, by a panel of three judges, one of whom is an experienced businessman. So that gives us an opportunity to bring in experienced people, having inside knowledge, having insights in a, in a business. And uh, that clearly is valuable. And um, particularly in um, competition cases, in cartel cases, uh, there we have specialized panels composed of um, two judges, two professional judges, and two lay judges. And even at the Supreme Court, that is a, an exception, a fundamental exception, we have three professional judges and two lay judges in competition law cases. And uh, the judges, the lay judges there, bring in tremendous expertise. They are uh, selected by the Chamber of Commerce and the Labor Chamber, respectively. And uh, they are cartel law experts. Um, and they bring in tremendous expertise. Uh, and I really, I, I am sitting in this panel and uh, from uh, January 1st next year, I'll uh, be presiding this uh, competition law panel. And I enjoy working with them uh, tremendously. So clearly uh, in areas where special expertise is required or even helpful, uh, it's clearly a good idea to bring in this additional expertise, which a professional judge who has always worked just as a lawyer uh, can never have. Thank you, Professor Kodak. Uh, that's a very interesting insight. And indeed, um, I'm aware of a number of jurisdictions where competition commissions act as judicial organs, at least at the first instance. And there it is almost given that you will have uh, non-lawyers participate who are uh, instrumental in order for uh, an award to be delivered. And with this, uh, I would like to um, 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 address a similar question to Bastian. Bastian, what is the composition of the Enterprise Chamber? I mean, um, do, we, um, do we have professional judges there? Do we have former practitioners? Or can people that sit on the Enterprise Chamber can currently do other things outside the court. Uh, why is it that um, it, it has become so popular? Could it be something not so much in relation to its powers, but in relation to the composition thereof? Yeah, yeah thank you, Pavlos. That's a very good uh, question. So, um, the so in the Netherlands we have a long tradition of judges being being uh, judges for a long time. So we don't have that many practitioners that also become a judge or at a later stage of their career become a judge. Uh, we do have that the enterprise chamber. It's a relatively prestigious position, uh, which means that that good judges tend to want to take that position, especially the position of chairman of the uh, of the enterprise chamber, um, which means that that they have a lot high level of skill uh, and expertise. And in addition to that, uh, for the, for the, so that's for the judges themselves. The judges themselves generally don't have uh, too many auxiliary, auxiliary activities. They, they could be, for instance, an arbitrator in some types of uh, situations. They do that next to their work as a judge. But other than that, it's relatively, um, uh, relatively minor. We do see that the judges try also to be active within the, the corporate litigation and, and corporate academic world. So they tend to publish, they tend to uh, be part of, of associations or even board members of those associations. Uh, so in that sense, they are very close to the practice that they see in front of them every day. And uh, in addition to that, for the layman judges, so for the experts, um, I think it's similar to what we've heard about Austria. It's, it's, a, um, it's not so much the pay that's interesting for these people. It's more the, the work itself that they, that they are allowed to do. 
um, and the position that's relatively relatively prestigious and interesting to to have. Um, so I think it's a combination of that, and and um, as a result, you also get from from the experts you get people with high expertise that are very good at what they do. Um, and I think I mentioned very briefly during the presentation that uh, that the, the judges themselves or one particular judge there, they're also very proactive about telling the community what's possible within their court. And that also makes that um, uh, they really invite almost uh, the attorneys to bring cases that are interesting to their court, which means that as a result, and that's also, I think, one of the reasons that they're so popular and that um, uh, people like to bring cases there because they know who the judges will be. They know they're very experienced and well-reasoned and have a high level of expertise. Uh, so that all contributes to the fact that this is such a popular, popular uh, business court. Thank you, Bastian. Um, let me now turn to Paula. Uh, so, Paula, I understand from your presentation that currently there is no specialized corporate court in Spain, but uh, that uh, it seems to me that there might be demand for it. Uh, to what extent do you think that Spain is close to introducing, uh, setting up a specialized court and do you see interest groups uh, from the industry or uh, listed companies lobbying towards this direction? Is there an appetite by the Spanish government to compete uh, with arbitral venues, local arbitral venues, so that parties can refer their cases to state litigation over arbitration? Thank you. you. You did understand correctly. We we have one level of specialized business courts, meaning that they hold jurisdiction for all of the matters that I mentioned before, including company law. So this may range to up to 10 to 12 different matters. So no specific uh, corporate court. And to my knowledge, at least, no uh, pressure today to the enactment or creation of specific um, company courts or capital markets courts. I was I was listening to the first uh, presentation to the keynote uh, speech uh, uh, regarding this uh, idea of uh, creating even further specialization uh, at the administrative level. So, so establishing whether uh, public enforcement is reviewed in front of an administrative court to create a sort of specialization there. And I found that extremely interesting, but I see no evidence of uh, pressure in that regard. I um, Maybe it's important to note that Spanish courts are also among the slowest uh, within continental Europe, I think only followed or only after Italy. Uh, and uh, to my knowledge, uh, the priority would be placed in trying to uh, accelerate the overall result, but not to, to this day, um, try to narrow down the, the scope of, of authority or, or jurisdiction to specific matters. Um, also, I, I believe that that study from 2020, where uh, Professor Gelter authored chapter three, uh, did place a focus on how Spain, together with Brazil, was one of the jurisdictions that uh, encouraged the most uh, arbitration in company law and specifically in public listed companies. So maybe that's that's one way to go there. Thank you. Thank you, Paola. Um, just one remark. Uh, you said that the Spanish courts, they lag only behind Italy in terms of how quick they are. I think you forget to put Greece into the equation here. Uh, someone who litigates before Greek courts, I must say that we are encountering the same challenge um, uh, over the years. And um, let me now turn to Jacek. Um, uh, I did I did listen uh, with great interest to, to the idea of a capital markets court in in Poland, and um, I would like to. Um, uh, discuss with you what has been discussed uh, with um, uh, with Professor Kodek um, uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, assuming that this uh, idea uh, materializes, uh, how likely you think it is that this court is going to allow proceedings 
uh, to be conducted in English and potentially to have lawyers that are admitted outside Poland be able to litigate before such courts. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think that if, if, if the idea of a capital markets court uh, is, uh, is uh, an instrument to attract investment, and that could also result in uh, law firms, international law firms, wanting to set up uh, offices in Warsaw or, or elsewhere in Poland. So um, do you think that constitutionally or from the institutional framework, it would be possible to have uh, proceedings in English in Poland? And do you think that foreign lawyers can be admitted to practice before this court? Okay, so th thank you very much for these uh, questions, Pablo. So first of all, maybe it's fair to say that uh, the, 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 so the discussions on the capital markets court in Poland, they are at a pr pretty early stage. It's, I would say it's a conceptual stage. So we have the paper that uh, was prepared by uh, by Ararat Institute under the uh, under the supervision or lead of uh, ADEC, uh, but uh, there is nothing that we can that we, that we, that we can view, view as some sort of a legislative proposal or a more structured uh, um, structured uh, vision of this of this court. So uh, this is this is like a general disclaimer. And moving to the moving to the to the comp to, to, to the language issue. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this may be a, a valid question, especially that, given that um, the knowledge, like the general knowledge of Polish language, is pro pro not comparable to, 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 to this of, of German that, that, that you have in Austria, and uh, probably Polish uh, is one of the or one of the most difficult languages to learn for a foreigner as well. But um, personally, I, 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 ha I haven't I haven't heard of an idea to allow proceedings in foreign languages in Polish in Polish state courts. What I believe here to be the key factor is like first first is the like let's say constitutional uh, framework connected to the uh, right to the right to justice and so on which means that probably this could this could be only possible uh, upon mutual understanding of of the parties so um, no one no one can be forced to to have uh, their case heard and reviewed in a different language than Polish. That's, that's, what, that, that's what I would believe. But the question is whether the parties can, can decide uh, by mutual understanding to opt for a different uh, language of proceedings. Uh, to my best knowledge, and this is similar to what uh, Professor Codex said before, that there is no statutory basis uh, for, su for such a solution. And this means probably that, uh, the, the, for example, the, ruling, the, the court ruling the decision and the other uh, ancillary decisions of the courts, they have to be done in Polish, uh, whether whether it can be whether, whether the evidentiary proceeding or the pleadings, whether this can be done in English, probably this is something that I can that, that I can imagine more. So this is something that I consider more realistic. But uh, for the time being, to be honest, it appears to me to be a quite remote, um, remote perspective in terms of uh, in terms of timing, but also in terms of, let's say, uh, the, the approach. But uh, what I believe here to be the, the relevant factor is uh, what would be the composition of the courts? Mm, because the, during, during my keynote speech, I, I, I said that I'm a bit skeptic as towards um, the honorary members are, are concerned or some laymen are concerned. But uh, it's not the case that I'm that I'm that I'm, that I'm opposed to having uh, people from the industry being on the bench of this court. Uh, on the opposite, I believe that uh, the natural source uh, of potential judges should be lawyers. Who are also involved, let's say, in the business on the business side of the market. The, the point that I wanted to make is that what I believe would be beneficial for this court is that uh, the, the job with the court or the engagement with the court should be like maybe not the sole, maybe, maybe not the sole, because I can imagine maybe some side activities. But uh, I believe that this would be the core activity or the main activity uh, of uh, the, those uh, of these individuals uh, that would that would that would be the judges. So so as to avoid a situation where you have. Uh, where, where you have judges or lay judges uh, who treat this as some sort of uh, additional uh, additional activity and are generally active as commercial lawyers or as arbitrators or uh, doing something else, but consider this like, like an after hours job to be sitting on the bench of this court. So that I that I that I'm not a big 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 supporter of. Uh, but uh, what I believe is that if we go the route of having people from the industry uh, joining this court as full-time judges of the uh, capital markets court, then this would clearly also support uh, the idea of allowing foreign languages 
as uh, as pro proceeding languages uh, in this course. So the more we open the recruitment process of potential judges um, for people uh, from from the market, ex attorneys, ex in house lawyers, ex investment bankers with some legal let's say interest, uh, then uh, th then the more the, the higher the chances of um, of allowing the foreign languages. Uh, as, a, as a language of proceedings. But as I said in the very beginning, we are at a very early stage and for the time being, it, for me, it's quite difficult to imagine a state court uh, operating in, in a foreign language. Thank you, Jacek. That's, uh, that's very, um, uh, uh, very insightful uh, comment uh, you made. Uh, we have, uh, I think, two minutes left, uh, taking into account that uh, we, we commenced with, uh, with a few minutes delay. And I would like to um, uh, open um, a question to to everyone, uh, to anyone who wishes to respond uh, uh, in the panel. Uh, we are at the moment entertaining the idea of launching in a number of jurisdictions specialized courts, possibly uh, courts uh, that uh, can adjudicate in English. Uh, we've been informed that Germany already has this, the Netherlands we know it has, um, to what extent, and that again is up to anyone to respond, to what extent do you think that um, it is uh, likely that in the near future we'll be seeing regulatory competition among member states in the EU to attract uh, litigation, to attract the referral of cases into, um, uh, into its court? We've seen regulatory competition and suing in relation to incorporations. Uh, how likely is it that member states will, in the near future, uh, compete to attract litigation and to be known as uh, commercial or corporate litigation venues? Um, I, I think it's already happening. Um, we see a number of uh, prominent cases um, being filed uh, in the United Kingdom or in the Netherlands uh, or in the United States. And there are some lawyers very actively work on um, attracting international business, international cases and bringing these cases in their respective countries. So I know of a number of mass claims uh, being brought in the Netherlands uh, where the, the, the plaintiffs, the original plaintiffs, um, or the, the victims of the tort um, are people from Germany and Austria. So that clearly is already happening now. And if a country has an attractive procedure, has an attractive venue, then that also is noticed by the international legal community and does work to attract um, litigation and uh, high profile cases. And I think that development is very likely to increase. And having English language courts in non English speaking countries is part of that development. Thank you, Professor Kodak. Um, would anyone else like to, to comment on, on this? Uh, I mean, B Bastian, uh, yeah, being yeah. from one of the countries that has an English speaking court, what do you think? Yeah, and no, I, I can only agree with George. I think uh, it's absolutely correct. So especially in, in, in class action type of litigation, you already see a lot of competition uh, where the Netherlands is also taking a very, pro or at least certain attorneys in the Netherlands are already taking a very proactive uh, uh, stance. I think most you will see that most of those cases aren't actually litigated in the English speaking court. So in the Dutch commercial court, because in order to come to the Dutch commercial court, you need the, uh, uh, the approval of our po all parties involved, which is generally difficult to get by the time that everyone's fighting with each other. Um, so I'm, I think if you want to look at regulatory competition between courts, it's probably that the regulatory competition will be more from a material law point of view than from a procedural law point of view, or at least purely procedural in the sense of uh, whether you can speak English, whether you can set the timing of the steps in the litigation yourself. Um, I think it's more of a question, can I go to this court? Uh, uh, to what extent can this court uh, issue a binding ruling for all citizens in the EU? 
Um, those are, I think, the, the, the main items that parties and their attorneys are looking for when determining which jurisdiction they go to. Um, and, the, and the language of the litigation itself is, is slightly less relevant. We see that the Dutch commercial courts, so where you can litigate in English, it doesn't have that many cases yet. It has been around for, I think, two or three years, but it has a relatively limited amount of cases. And a lot of these large cases are still just going to the ordinary courts. Thank you, Bastian. So um, I think I think we've uh, we've run out of time. We could, I mean, continue for uh, uh, for uh, um, at least another hour or a few hours discussing this. I think it's uh, it's it's very interesting. All the insights that have been shared uh, in this panel. So um, I would like to thank all panelists and our keynote speaker. Uh, for um, uh, participating uh, in uh, today's uh, morning session. And I would also like to thank uh, the attendants um, uh, for taking time off their business schedules to, um, uh, to listen to this discussion. And I'm hoping that uh, next week, indeed, uh, Austria will go out of lockdown and there can be uh, some interesting discussions on site at the Polish Academy of Sciences. So thank you all again uh, for this interesting session. <clears throat> and uh, I guess uh, we're now holding our first break for, uh, for the day. And we will resume uh, in uh, 20 minutes from now uh, for the second panel. <clears throat>